dots of what we've done so far this year. We're studying about the Jews of the Ottoman Empire, the Spartan that came eastward, and also about the Balkans, because we've just visited three Balkan countries. You know, I've talked a little bit about what we've done, what we've studied, some of the questions, some of the issues that have come up. So he might not stick to his, this original uh, thing called the, Spartac uh, the Trans-Mediterranean Spartan Culture, because he might also open up to questions that you still might have regarding our, 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 our most recent trip. So uh, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Pompo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, okay, so let's start. I understand you've been to the Balkans recently. I hope you can all understand and follow my accent. Now, uh, I want you to concentrate together with me on some opportunities in Spain before the expulsion, right? Um, I will magnify actually the map so we can see the names of the cities, but these are actually the main communities in Spain prior to 1492 expulsion, right? So, um, I would like to ask you, do you pay attention uh, where these communities are? Sea wisely or continent wisely, right? So you saw previously the big picture of entire uh, Iberian Peninsula, right? And these are the main Jewish communities in the peninsula. And now we are moving closer. So you can see that even those communities who looked like near the seaside, they are basically, they are basically not that, uh, that close to the sea. Okay, this one for example. Uh, okay, Tarazona, so whatever, Tortosa, Girona, even Girona is not on the seaside. Uh, okay, Segovia, Avila, Toledo, so you can see all these communities are deep inland, right? And very few communities like Barcelona or Malaga are actually on the seaside. So what does this, what does this tell us you see here, right? Cordoba, for example, or Seville, Lucena. Lucena was the mother of all yeshivot in Spain. The, the crown of Torah moved from uh, North Morocco to Lucena, right? And then from there, all over Spain. So all these communities are continental. You could actually say that most of the time, most of the Jews in Spain lived inland. So, with the expulsion, something really uh, interesting happens, as you can see here. Basically, once the Jews of Spain were forced to either convert to Christianity or leave, how many, how big the communities are? What are the figures? Do you have any idea? How many Jews were there in Spain to start with in 1492? Are we talking a lot? What's a lot? 5,000, 50,000, 5 million? 500,000. <coughs> Okay, it's, yeah, well, we don't know the exact number, but we agree what we, the estimation in the research is that in 1391, 100 years before the explosion, in 1391, there were approximately 600,000 Jews in Spain. 600,000 Jews. That's, consequently, that was not only the most important community, uh, culturally and economically, but also the biggest community and quantity and quality, quality and quantity many a time go together because only quantity, only big quantity can give some big quality. In any case, what happened in 1391 was that 200,000 Jews, approximately, approximately a third of the Spanish Jewry were forcefully converted, not by the king and the queen, not by the uh, high hierarchy of the church, but rather by the mob instigated by uh, low-level mobs. <laughs> but it was a third of Spanish Jewry that was forcefully converted in 1391. So basically in 1492 we have approximately 400,000 Jews. By the end of it, 
two additional 200,000 converted and approximately 200,000 left. So basically, more Jews stayed in Spain under the Christian disguise than ever leaving it. In subsequent centuries, in 16th, 17th, 18th century, you will have uh, Jews keeping coming out of Spain and rejoining Judaism in uh, three Protestant cities, uh, mostly in Holland, later in London, later in New Amsterdam, which for unknown reasons today is called New York. So, what we see though, that those 200,000 people that left Spain, <coughs> do you see where did they resettle? They actually created, uh, what did we say? All over. Not really all no. <laughs> no, not really all <coughs> Not really all over, that's what's most well, interesting aspect of it. Well, ports. ports, obviously, because they left Spain, many of them left Spain by boat, so leaving from a port and going to a port. Now, what is extremely important to understand in this particular point in uh, time is that all those people who were kicked from Spain uh, and made it too much into inland. They assimilated into other Jewish groups. Only those who stayed around the Mediterranean Sea, okay, only those were able of preserving their distinctive Sephardic identity, mentality, language, culture, approach to Allah. So basically, in Spain, Jews were not a Mediterranean community, even though Spain itself is a Mediterranean country. Because most of the Jews did not live in the Mediterranean area of Spain, but rather deep in inland. However, though, with the expulsion, the new entity in Jewish world is created, that we can simply call it virtual Sephardim. It never existed. It didn't really have borders. It didn't have a king. It didn't have a queen, and it didn't have a parliament. But what it did have was a vibrating Jewish community, unified around three things, and we will see them. Now, those who came to northern Morocco <coughs> maintained their distinctive uh, tradition and culture until this very day. Those who went deep into Moroccan <coughs> within a century or two, <coughs> assimilated with Toshavim, local Moroccan Jews. The same is true here. Those who came, uh, those who came to Greece and Turkey and uh, Anadolia and Dalmatia, they all maintained contacts across the sea with other Sephardim. So basically, we can imagine virtual Sephardim as Jewish Venetia. What's special about city of Venetia? Venice. What's special about Venice? On water. <laughs> Instead, yeah, exactly. It's a city on water. So in order to get, to get from one point to another, most of the time you need to use a boat, right? <coughs> so this kind, this, so Venetia, not only the city itself is on the sea, uh, like islands in the sea and small houses in the sea, but it also it also had <coughs> it also used to run uh, a mid-sized empire called Venetian Republic, and it's, it was all across the seas. So, just like the Venetians, the Sephardim basically used to cross the sea on daily basis. It's easier for Sephardic Jews to cross the sea than to cross the mountain and go inland. Now, if you compare, you can compare Ashkenazim and Sephardim on many different levels. Uh, one of the main differences between Sephardic and Ashkenazi communities, historically speaking, is that Ashkenazi communities are river-centered communities. What does that mean? You have a river, you have a big city, and then up the river and down the river there are two cities without the Jewish community. There are cities, but they don't necessarily have a Jewish community. But within 100 years, right, that Jewish community will develop satellites 
above and below on the river. Now, Ashkenazi culture, Eastern European, Central European and Eastern European Ashkenazi culture is basically a river-based culture. Sephardic culture, post-expulsion from 1492, uh, from 1492 to 1948, is Mediterranean culture. Now, by whom the city of Tel Aviv was built? Ashkenazim or Sephardim? Okay, so is it a river city or a sea city? Exactly. It's, it has a tiny river, totally non important, <coughs> but the people took the Mediterranean Sea for a river. What's the difference? How do you build a city? How do you build a city on a sea? Who, who, <laughs> whoever in the group tried ever to sleep in Tel Aviv unsuccessfully? Can you sleep in Tel Aviv without air condition? Yeah. No. Why? <laughs> Why? Because of the sea? Well, there is city in Salonika, but everybody's left. There is sea in Istanbul, quite few of them, but everybody's left. Because in a Mediterranean city, all main streets go to the sea. And it's from the sea that the wind comes into the city and makes, it, makes the life bearable. However, though, when you build a city on a river, <coughs> then all main streets are parallel to the river. Now, when Ashkenazim came, to Israel, <laughs> they took the Mediterranean Sea to be a nice copy of Volga, and then they built streets parallel to the sea. So the first street closed the city, and then every second street doesn't matter. You can't breathe anyways. But then, even if the cities, even if the cities, even if the cities were created before, like Haifa, with Zionism and with huge influx of Ashkenazi Jews, what do you have in Haifa in front of the sea? Have you been to Haifa? Yeah. yeah, so what prevents Haifa from ever having the sea? The railway station. Right? Why? Because the people who reshaped Haifa didn't really know what to do with the sea. They are not coming from the sea culture. Now, back to our back to the subject of our lecture. So, we have 200,000 Jews leaving Spain. Most of them leave by boats, either to go to Morocco or to go to Papal Lands or to go to Ottoman Empire, right? The first generation usually gets off the boat and stays in the place where they got off the boat. It's only 100 uh, or even more years later that they develop satellite communities in the inland. Not because they are converting from Mediterranean people into mountain people, but rather because they need to bring the merchandise Actually, the Jews are the middlemen. So, they are actually gathering the sea which divides the Christendom from Islam. And Jews could move freely in both rivers. Who? Jews. Which Jews? Sephardic Jews. So, what do they do? They basically introduced Islamic merchandise to Christian Europe, Christian merchandise to Islamic Europe, and continental merchandise to sea, sea merchandise to continents. So basically, uh, if, you had, uh, if you had a Jewish company in Sarajevo, the guy would have one son in Dubrovnik, <coughs> on the seaside, and another son in Split, right? And then one of the sons would get married with a girl from Ancona, and the other would get married with a girl from Salonika. Now, this was the way they built their infrastructure. Uh, they, 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 they built their own um, community. And anybody who for whatever reason left the sea was assimilated into other groups of Jews. Either into Ashkenazim or into the Orientals. Okay. Now I want you to concentrate together with me on other aspects of this phenomena. 200,000 people are leaving Spain. They don't know. They obviously, they cannot all of them move to one single country. They don't have a clue how to preserve their identity and their culture. Yes, they are Jewish, but they are Jewish in a very specific way. You are all Jewish, but if I was to bring you to a Jewish tribe someplace in the world, 
I'm not sure you would assimilate very easily and very soon. Okay? So, the three cornerstones of the virtual Sephardah were let down in 16th century. Spontaneously, consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously. But these three are the sea, as I said. Because as soon as, would they, as, as they would leave the sea, they would, they would have to leave their Sephardic identity. Not necessarily their Jewish identity their specific Jewish identity, which is a part of identity. The second thing is the language. And the third thing is the law. Now the language. Let's concentrate on the language. The Jews in Spain, what language they spoke? Of course not. Of course not. Why would, what, what under the sun would make you say such thing? It's notorious impossibility. <coughs> Do the Jews in America speak English or Jewish? <coughs> Do they speak Jewish English or English? English? English. And still, what unites them with other English speakers in their own countries is much bigger than what unites them with other Jews. So a Jew from Alabama is immediately recognized as Alabama, right? As from Alabama because he speaks with Alabama accent. And the Jews and the Jew from New York is immediately recognized as a Jew from New York. Both of them can use 100 <coughs> Hebrew words with Yiddish accent saying, darling, would you like me to make the Kiddush in the Sukkah or inside? But it doesn't constitute another language. This doesn't constitute another language. This is plain New York English or this is plain uh, Alabama English. When do we speak about a different language? <coughs> Besides that, there was not a single language in Spain. The Jews of Andalusia spoke Arabic until 1492. The Jews of Castilla spoke Castilian. The Jews of Aragon spoke Aragonese. The Jews of Catalonia spoke Catalan. The Jews of Valencia spoke Valencian. There is not a single language in Spain. And Jews in every single realm in Spain spoke the language of that realm, adding words like Kiddush, Abdallah, Alel, Sukkah, Lulav, Mulas. The rest of it was just like anybody else. So no, there was no Ladino in Spain. There, sh there was no reason for Ladino in Spain. Now all of those Jews are leaving in 1492. And if, if all Jews of Barcelona were to resettle in Istanbul, and all Jews of Toledo were to resettle in Salonika, and all Jews of Granada were to resettle in Sarajevo, this story would be much easier to tell. The problem was that everybody got everywhere. So what happened is that once they were in Spain, all, all the time they were in Spain, they could sustain the illusion that they had one single, country, one single nation, uh, one single Jewish ritual, Sephardic, Spanish. They are different than Ashkenazi, they are different than the Orientals, but at least they are similar to themselves. Once they were expelled from Spain, they recognized how not similar to themselves they are. Why? Because you would have, uh, let's say, you would say <coughs> in Istanbul, you would have people from Portugal and people from Barcelona and people from Toledo living uh, next to each other. And they would build different synagogues. And they would insist on different melodies and when you are remote you concentrate when you concentrate on what unites you when you are very close you concentrate on what disunites you what's different so once they were remote from each other in Spain they had this illusion of being one once they were brought by facts of life to live next to each other they recognize how different they are so they stopped getting married with each other and they start praying with each other. And every single community had its own bad theme. And then there was a huge problem. What's the... Now imagine, they are coming sometimes to places where there are no other Jews. <coughs> but they themselves are divided. So they establish, the newcomers establish three Jewish communities, four Jewish communities, four synagogues, four of them communities. But sometimes they are coming to a place where there are already Jewish communities. They don't mingle with them. They don't intermarry with them. 
they considered them to be, for example, when, when the Sephardim came to Morocco, they were local Jews who lived in Morocco for a thousand years. So, what do you think, how did the Sephardim call the locals? Forasteros. Foreigners. I mean, who the heck are you? How can you call foreigners somebody who was born there, and whose grandfather was born there, and whose great-grandfather was born there? But they did So the same is true about any place that they came to. Not only they didn't unite with the local Jewish community, but they were also divided between themselves. So they had their own synagogues, Aragon, and Castile, and Portugal. The synagogue would be called Portugal. The synagogue would be called Aragon. People would make Nedarim that they will never ever. Explain you have rabbinical explain Nedarim. Ah, Nedarim is oaths. You have rabbinical responsa, right? Dealing with the phenomena of people making an oath that they will never pray in the other synagogue. And then by some misfortune, their own synagogue is destroyed. And they are professional Jews, like Hazarim, let's say. So they need a synagogue in order to live. But they made an oath. They will never go to that synagogue. So they turn to the rabbis and they ask the rabbis, what should I do now? But, okay. So what happened during the 16th century? The entire 16th century, from 1492 till, let's say, 1599, was dedicated to a reunification of Sephardim. Not only the sea, but the sea was also, as I said, one of the factors, the language. Ladina was created basically uh, after the explosion. And it was created mostly in the Ottoman Empire. And it became the lingua franca of the virtual separato. And then many Jews spoke and during the first hundred years, many Jews proceeded speaking their own Iberian language, like por uh, Portuguese, but somehow, and if you want me, I can elaborate and explain why from all Iberian languages, the Castilian took, uh, the Castilian prevailed. And then within 100 years, everybody switched to Castilian. However, though, until this very day, Many Ladino speakers speak their own Judeo-Castilian called Ladino with different accents. People in the north, they still speak Ladino, which is Judeo-Castilian. They speak it with Portuguese pronunciation, the Portuguese accent. And the people in the south, they speak it with whatever. So, the language. Ladino was created as the language of the citizens of virtual separate. Uh, the phenomena was to some extent parallel to the phenomena happening in the New World. The same time or the same year when the Jews were expelled from Spain, Columbus went and discovered the New World, right? So in the New World, there were, in Latin America, there were uh, governors sent from different parts of Spain. So some people were from Valencia, and other people were from, uh, from Castilla, and other people were from Catalonia. But none of them spoke their own respective languages when writing back to the court. Everybody wrote in Castilian. So Castilian became the lengua franca of the New World. Why? Because the queen, who was more powerful than the king, she was Castilian. And she was running the show, and everybody switched to the language of the queen. The same is true about the Jewish world. Imagine. Spain, Jews are leaving to the old world, and Christian sailors are leaving for the new world. So Spain establishes, at that moment in history, Spain was what America was 20 years ago. The biggest world superpower, okay? At that moment. So the Jews over here, consciously or subconsciously, are following the pattern, forgetting their own Iberian languages, and embracing Judeo-Castilian, which today we call Ladino. So that's the second cornerstone. But the third cornerstone is the cornerstone of the law. What do you know about the attempts of unification of the law in the aftermath of the expulsion? <coughs> I'm sure you know it, it's just that you can't connect to the knowledge, to the knowledge you have. It's 
It's called passive knowledge. What was the problem? The problem was different minhagi, right? So these people checked the night, different customs. So these people checked the knife like that, and these people checked the knife like that. We don't teach from each other's uh, slaughtering. These people sing that chapter before that psalm, and these people sing the psalm and then the chapter from Mishnah. So they can't pray together. So there was a dire need for halakhical unification, for legal unification. What happened? First, Rabbi Yaakov Berav had the idea of re-establishing the Sanhedrin. He said, every single community has different minagim. That was livable with all the way every single community was its own place. But now we have all these communities mixed and they want to keep separated. So, he says, let's renew the Sanhedrin, and then the Sanhedrin will decide all the laws. And it unified the practice for all the Jews. Who was... did it work? What do you think? What do you know? It didn't work. Why it didn't work? Who was against? The people, the rabbis, girls, ladies, children, who was against? The rabbis. Yeah, sounds oxymoronic, but it's, it's totally true. Why would the rabbis be against the Sanhedrin? You should rather say it should be there by three. Sanhedrin. <laughs> we established them for the Sanhedrin, so why why wouldn't they go for it? I'm a good Well, they. Rabbi Yaakov Berav, don't forget. <laughs> Israel is here, part of the Ottoman Empire. So Jews moved here. Uh, after the expulsion. And Rabbi Yaakov Berah was trying to establish the Sanhedrin here, in the north of Israel. He was trying to establish Sanhedrin in the Tzfat area. And the entire mystical movement and Lurian Kabbalah and all of that 16th century uh, mysticism in, in, in Tzfat has to do with Messianic hopes. So why would rabbis be against it? It's very simple. Be a rabbi. Imagine for a moment that you are a rabbi. You are a rabbi. No, don't just a moment. Don't think about Jewish people. Think about yourself as a rabbi and where your interests lie. Yes, please. Of course. As simple as that. As simple as that. If they were to recognize Sanhedrin, 70 people would have top job and everybody else would be their underdog. Everybody else would be their clerk. Everybody else would be doing what they say. Now, you know rabbis doesn't work for them. So they didn't like the idea. So that's the first attempt. Failed. But we see what, the, what, was, what, was the, what was the goal. The goal was to unify the expulsives. The other attempt, Rabbi or Ribi, in Sephardic tradition you say Ribi, not Rabbi. Ribi, Yosef Karo, says why they didn't accept Maimonides. Do you know why Maimonides was not accepted? I mean, officially, when people say that Maimonides was not accepted, what do they usually say why he was not accepted? Have a big one? Maimonides. Right. Complicated. Uh, complicated because Islam is not Christianity and it's totally permissible under Jewish law to say that Muhammad was a prophet in order not to lose your head and your life. And that's the same ruling that Maimonides, uh, the same ruling that Maimonides wrote about in his Igeret Teman, the Yemenite epistle, right? Uh, he applied it to himself. There was a king, Berber king in Spain, who said, by tomorrow there are no more Jews or Christians in my land. Everybody is master. Now, you could actively seek for martyrdom for uh, martyrhood, or martyrdom, or you could pretend to be Muslim by the way you dress and be uh, secretly Jewish. Now, there are authorities in Jewish law which consider Christianity to be idolatry, there are authorities which don't. There is not a single authority in Judaism which considers Islam to be idolatry. Nobody considers Islam to be idolatry. Islam is purely monotheistic. You might like it, 
You might like it, you might dislike it. But idolatry, it's not. Okay? So, my monitor says, nobody ever told you that you should give up your life only in order not to say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad I believe that Muhammad is his prophet and messenger. His prophet and servant, or his messenger and servant. It's a false, according to Ramban, it's a false, a false witness thing. You're not supposed to give your life on false witness. You just... We have Shlosha, shel, that's in, in, in uh, Sephardic accent, you would say Shlosha Devarim Yehareg Uval Ya'avur. There are three things the, pers the person is supposed to give his <coughs> life up and not, not to transgress. Idolatry, murder, murder and incest. So if somebody puts if somebody puts a gun next to your head and says, sleep with your mother or I will kill you, you are supposed to go for martyrdom. If you don't, you are not legally responsible for your actions. But it's advisable to give up on your life. But nobody ever said that you should give up your life only in order not to say that Muhammad is prophet. Muhammad is a prophet. Okay. I'm not ready to give up my life for that. So no, that wasn't the reason. But that was a nice point. The reason was again. He made the rabbis superficial, because Maimonides said, between the Torah and my book, you don't need any other book. This book summarizes everything you ever needed to know in a very Aristotelian logical way. You can throw all other books and now you can finally learn philosophy, <coughs> because there is no need for other things. So that's the main reason. But they never said it that way. What they said is, because he didn't write footnotes. That's what Rabbi said, because Maimonides didn't write footnotes. What does that mean, footnotes? He never said, where does he extract his law from Talmud? Now, is this something that Maimonides just forgot? No. He was personally asked, in one of the letters, he was asked, why didn't you write footnotes for your rulings? And he said, for two reasons. People who know where is this from, don't need footnotes. And people who don't know where is this from, don't need footnotes. So nobody needs footnotes. That's Maimonides' answer. So Rabbi Yosef Karo <coughs> believed, really, that the reason why rabbis didn't accept Maimonides was because he didn't make footnotes. So the guy says, I will write footnotes. And he does. He invests 20 years of his life to write footnotes to Maimonides. And that book is called no, no, you know stuff, but you don't connect it. That book is called Kesef Mishneh. Rabbi Yosef Karo's commentary to Mishneh Torah is called Kesef Mishneh. What's the name of the guy? What's the name of the author? Yosef. Great. What Kesef Mishneh means? Commentary on Mishneh. Commentary What does that mean? Money. Secondary money. So, <coughs> secondary money, what the heck is secondary money? <coughs> Come on, Jewish associations. Genesis. Joseph. Joseph, you remember when Joseph uh, was manipulated his brothers into going back to their father and then coming back and leaving, whatever? You remember? Yeah. So, what did they have in their uh, backpacks? Kesef. Mishneh. So that's why the book is called Kesef Mishneh. Because it brings them back to Joseph's authority and <coughs> ruling. Now, what did the rabbi say when he wrote the footnotes, when he wrote Kesef Mishneh? What was the rabbinical response? Did they accept and said, oh great, now we have Maimonides footnotes, let's all go by it. No. So what was the response? Oh, you shouldn't have bothered. You shouldn't have bothered. So then, he recognizes uh, two problems. One problem is, rabbis will never accept a living rabbinical authority. So he needs to have that deen of dead rabbis, because that's something that living rabbis can deal with. And second thing is, second thing is, um, he needs to unify three different, uh, three different Jewish communities. He needs to unify the Jews who left Christian Spain, the Jews who left Muslim Spain, and do the Jews who lived in the Orient 
and accepted the expulsives. So he did, and that's beautiful. That's the biggest Jewish trick ever. Right? You will be here in Jesus. And <coughs> what he did is, he said, let's take one representative of each tradition. Let's take Rosh and his son who wrote book Arba Turim to represent the tradition of Christian Spain. And let's take Rif, the Mitzchak al Fasi, to represent the Maghreb, Muslim Spain, Muslim Spain, Maghreb tradition. And let's take the Maimonides, who moved from Spain to Egypt, to represent the Oriental tradition. And then he says, I will take the book written by this guy from Christian Spain. Okay? Now, what was his name again? Not his, the name of the, of the guy who, whose book he took. That's the first thing. Now we are in his second attempt to solve the problem. Arba'a Turim. Rosh is the father. What's the name of the son? No. So, Rosh, where is he from? <coughs> Christian Spain, but he is Ashkenazi expulsi to Christian Spain. No, I know this is a bit hard to follow, but try to understand. When Spain changed hands, the leadership of Spanish Jewry needed rabbis who knew how to live within the Christian context. Now, they're old rabbis. They were old from Muslim context. So they imported an Ashkenazi rabbi and they gave him and they gave him the position of the head of the rabbinical court in Toledo. The son of this guy already writes a book, Codification of the Law, which is typical Sephardic custom. But so the form is Sephardic, but the content is already Christian, Judeo-Christian, European. You follow? Okay. So what happens is now Yosef Karo says, "I will take the book of this guy, and every single rule in that book, I will say." What does Rif says about this? What does Rambam says about this? And what does Rosh says about this? And I will go by majority. And he did. That's exactly what he did. That's the way he wrote his book, Bet Yosef, coming from the same biblical verse as Kesef, from the same biblical parasha as Kesef Mishneh. Right? And he wrote Bet Yosef, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, not only all the rabbis of the expulsees, but also all the rabbis of the Bukrebis and all the rabbis of the Oriental Jews accept one single book called Bet Yosef. And then they write to him and they tell him, we want you to summarize the book. And he says, okay, I will. Here is the summary of the book. It is called <coughs> Shulchan Aruch. Where does it come from? No. No. Well, if we don't know Jewish tradition, at least we know Christian tradition. Lord is my shepherd. You know in Hollywood movies, uh, when, you know on a burial, they recite the psalm. Which psalm? Lord is my shepherd, I shall not miss anything. What do we have in that psalm? Taaroch shulchan neged soredai. God, you will set my table against my enemies. <laughs> Who is saying this? King David. So Yosef Karo takes himself as new King David, whose rule is now whose ruling is now recognized by the entire people of Israel. Okay? And based on this psalm, he create, he, he names the book Shulchan Aruch. Okay. The Ashkenazim say, and this is uh, uh, beautiful. We should not miss the train. Finally, the entire Jewish world is unifying around one single book. Yes, we do have in Middle Europe and in Eastern Europe, we have different traditions. But if we lose this opportunity, two nations will be created. Ashkenazim will become people for themselves. Sephardim and Orientals will become people for themselves. We need to reunite around one single book. 
That's when they say, we will take Shulchan Aruch, which means the set table, and we will make Ashkenazi commentary to it called Mapa, the closing for the table. So Rabbi Moshe Seves, Rama, writes the Ashkenazi amendments to the new Jewish constitution called Shulchan Aruch. So basically, all the Jews were reunited by Shulchan Aruch. They were only very remote communities, like the Jews of China and, and Jews of Ethiopia and Jews who were not touched by the Shulchan Aruch. 95% of the Jewish uh, of, the world, of, of the Jewish world population agreed on Shulchan Aruch. So in the aftermath of the expulsion, one of the first one of the first achievements or one of the biggest achievements was not only the unification, they set their um, goals in the middle. They didn't set them high. They didn't really want they didn't really want reunification of the entire Jewish world. They had they had a concrete problem. The Jews from Christian Spain and Jews from ex-Muslim Spain are reuniting with the Jews in Maghreb and Jews in the Orient. And the Spanish Jews themselves are divided, let alone the local Jews. So, for example, if you read the introduction to uh, Ben Yosef, Yosef Karo says, uh, he quotes the biblical verse which says, you should have one single Torah, the born in faith and converts. That's the verse from the Torah. And then he says, but today, unfortunately, it looks as if, God forbid, there were hundred different Torahs. So he decides to reunify everybody. So, as I said, their goal was a middle goal. They achieved much more than they have ever hoped for. They achieved not only the unification of the expulsees, but unification of the expulsees amongst themselves, unification of the expulsees with the Mughabis and the Orientals, and unification of the Ashkenazim with everybody. Okay, so now we can, uh, yeah, so now we can see uh, how the virtual separat was created on the sea, the language, and the law. The, this aspect was basically, this aspect was basically all Jewish. Right? Not only the Sephardim got reunited, but Sephardim had two other aspects of their identity. The sea and the language. So whoever shared with them the law, he was fellow Jew. But if you didn't share the sea and the language, you were a different Jew. You were fellow Jew, you were still fellow Jew, but you were different. They had three aspect, main aspects of their identity. Now, if you compare, and that's very interesting, if you compare Mediterranean cultures to each other, you will see that the same way when you compare Jews to each other, there is always some common factor. There is always something that unifies all of them. But then when you compare different Mediterranean cultures to each other, you also see that there is something shared by the Greek and the Sephardic Jews and the Italians and the Moroccans and so on. This tradition uh, is different than Ashkenazi, for example, in three main ways. In three main ways. One, Ashkenazi culture is Talmudocentric. You, do you, do, I mean, would you agree? Yes. Okay. What does it mean, Talmudocentric? <coughs> Everything goes, everything circles around the Talmud. So when you say that the Jews are the people of the book, <coughs> it's not necessarily the Bible. It's much more the Talmud. Okay? There are reasons why is this so. There are economical reasons, and there are identity reasons. Ide Let's start with the identity reasons first. Christians are believers in the Old Testament also. So if you are people of the book and you share the same book, the borders between the two communities are not cut and clear. So the Jews, in order not to assimilate as a minority, they underlie the book which makes them different from their Christian neighbors. You follow? Very easy. If you and your Christian neighbor, you both 
cherish and respect the Old Testament, then how you are different from each other. So they want to maintain a different identity, so they say our main book is Talmud. Now, in the Islamic society, there is not a shared book. Muslims do recognize some ideal Torah, but as far as they are concerned, that Torah was lost. And the Torah the Jews have today was falsified by them. So Muslims don't learn Torah. So the Jews in the Muslim world could still insist on the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible or Tanakh as the cornerstone of their identity. But there is always, <coughs> you remember, once upon a time, one of the American parties used the slogan in the elections, it's the economy, stupid. You remember? Okay, so let's try to follow that uh, instruction. The Ashkenazim were tolerated in Europe, but they were not integrated. They lived in ghettos. Uh, so actually, if I'm to banalize and to make it easy to follow and grasp, it would look like this. Obviously, history is much bigger than what I'm going to say in the next two minutes. But we could say that Jews were imported to Europe by, aristoc by secular aristocracy to fill a certain void in the economic uh, life. Christianity very idealistically forbade banking, money lending, and banking. So aristocracy told the church, we need to solve the problem. And the church said, well, Christians can't do it. So they said, okay, so let's import some. So the same way today in Israel, they import people from Thailand to take care of our elders. They import Jews to take care of their money. But or Jews or were... Or is it more like we sell our homemade to a non-Jew? Yeah. So... We have a problem there are no non-Jews. Yeah, of course. The first, when you read in Chot Shabbat, in Maimonides, the, the Amira Legoi is the last thing that you see, conceptually. But when you open the Shulchan Aruch, Shabbos Goy is one of the first things in Shulchan Aruch because the system already relies totally on non-Jews. Now, the Christian society, the Christian society treated the Jews, how do you say trees in English? Trees. Do you know what you have in the middle? Blind. Blind. Window blinders. Something like that. Curtains. Okay. So the Christian society treated the Jews as curtains. What does that mean? You go to sleep. You don't need sun in your living room, so you put the curtains on. But then you get up. You need sun. You remove the curtains. So that's exactly how they treated the Jews. They said, we need you during the light day. During the daylight. So, in the morning we will open the ghetto, you will come to the, to the city and you will do your jobs. By the evening we don't need you anymore. We will collect you, put you back into your ghetto and put you under the key. Okay, so, in this type of society, I need you here to follow me closely. In this type of society, not too many people can provide a lifeboat. So the community developed system of integration for unemployed. Not everybody can be a banker, but everybody has ten children. So what do you do? Let's say you are a successful, successful banker, and I'm a successful banker, and you are a successful merchant, and he is. We set up a yeshiva, and we send all those, instead of telling them, well, guys, you can't work, so why don't you, you know, why don't you walk around and sleep in our lives while we do? It doesn't work that way. So you need to give them something to do. So they put them in the yeshiva, and basically the rich people supported yeshiva. There was na nothing similar to that in the Sephardic world. Yeshiva in Sephardic world were not places where everybody hangs, hangs out. In Sephardic world, these were professional schools for future judges 
End of story. You don't want to be a judge, you don't go to yeshiva. So Sephardic approach to Judaism is similar to American approach to Americanism, to French approach to Frenchism, to English approach to Englishism. What do I mean by that? How do you need, do you, in order to be American, do you need to learn your constitution by heart, every day? Do you need to engage with it? Do you need to study it? You don't even need to open it. You just need to oblige by it. And you oblige by it, but not in order to follow it, you don't need to know, you don't need to touch it. Why? Because it's transmitted to you by osmosis. Only by being born to your family and to your city and to your community, you learn everything you need to know without ever opening a book. How do we know that we shouldn't cross the street on the red light? Are there ill hot red lights? No, the society, exactly. So in Sephardic Judaism, in Sephardic Judaism, just like in American culture or in French culture or in English culture, in order to be Jewish, you didn't need to learn the law, 724. Most of the people were. Only the professionals went to yeshivot. And they were supported by the community the same way <coughs> Americans who have a good head for law are supported by philanthropes and they are given scholarships to go to Yale or Harvard. But not everybody needs to learn law. Now in Ashkenazi society, everybody needs to learn the law. And why is that so? Because many people were not let, were not allowed to work. So basically this was kind of, so economically speaking, this is the reason, and culturally speaking, or ident identity-wisely speaking, the reason is they wanted to underline the Talmud. In any case, the Ashkenazi Judaism is Talmudocentric Judaism. Right? And uh, when Ashkenazim need to quote something to underline they are Jewish, this will be some kind of pilpul, usually, from Talmud. That's the way you show, your, you show off your Jewishness. Now, the Sephardic Jewry, most of the people never saw it. Most of the Sephardic Jews never saw, never touched, never opened, never learned. Can you imagine? I mean, it's within the same people, it's so different. This was the book for the rabbis. The common people, they learned Sidur, Mahazor, and they learned uh, Kitsur, what we would call, they call today Kitsur Shulhan Aruch, that means the settled law, usually in their own language, Judo, Spanish, slash Ladino, or Judo Arabic. And they would learn a lot, a plenty of Tanakh. Even today, in Israel, Ashkenazi rabbis, even the chief Ashkenazi rabbis, don't dare to quote Torah in a Moroccan synagogue. Because there is no way they will not be corrected. <laughs> because they will say, Venatati Shalom Baaretz. And half of the synagogue will say, Venatati, Venatati, Venatati. Why? Because the accent is not on Natati, the accent is on Ti, the end, right? Venatati. And they do this totally subconsciously because everybody knows the text, everybody knows the text by heart. So, uh, one of the most typical, that, that's one of the differences between the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim, the, Talmudocentri the Talmudocentrism of Ashkenazi Judaism and Tanacho Liturgio or Liturgy Centrism of Sephardic uh, Judaism. The other difference, uh, the other difference is uh, mentality of ethnicity versus mentality of religious cult. Without ever putting it in words, pronouncing it or uh, declaring it, but when we analyze the way they acted, when we analyze their practice, we can see that the Sephardic rabbis conceived of Judaism as of ethnicity and not as of religious group or religious kind. Consequently, there are no Orthodox Sephardim, there are no conservative Sephardim, and there are no Reform Sephardim. The division on Orthodox, Conservative and Reform, which is so typical and so interesting and so important in uh, Ashkenazi Judaism, is totally unheard of, unimaginable, 
and basically impossible in the Sephardic, in the Sephardic world. Because the, the, the idea is that Judaism is ethnicity. So whether you want to, whether you don't want to, you belong to it anyways. So today you don't feel like it, but who cares? Probably tomorrow you will. So the idea was that when you are 20, nobody really expects you to be in the synagogue most of your time. Everybody expects you to go and whatever, uh, find yourself a girl and uh, have a family and so on. But if you are 60, the entire community would consider you to be a lunatic if you are not most of your time in the synagogue, because now you need to take care about your interests in the world to come because you are already with one leg over there. So I'll just give you a few I'll just give you a few anecdotes which show how it works. As Jay said previously, I was born in Sarajevo. So for us, Orthodox meant Christian. There were no Orthodox Jews. You couldn't possibly be Orthodox Jews. Because if you said you were Orthodox, that would mean you converted <laughs> to Greek Orthodox Church or Serbian Orthodox Church or Bulgarian Orthodox Church, or Russian Orthodox Church. There is no Jewish Orthodox Church. You can't be Orthodox if you are Jewish. Either you are Jewish or you are Orthodox. So when I was a kid, a group of Israelis comes to my community. And the secretary of the community shows them around. And it's 45 minutes that she's dealing with them. And it's more than enough minutes that she's the secretary of the Jewish community and that they are an Israeli group. Not even American Jewish, but Israeli. So after 45 minutes, one of the Israelis tells her, sorry, is this an Orthodox shul? And she says, no, 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 this is a Jewish shul. The Orthodox church is across the river, <laughs> right? Uh, now, I'll give you another example. I left Sarajevo, I left Sarajevo before the civil war in ex-Yugoslavia started. It started in 92. <coughs> so I left already in 91. So during the war, I went back home and there was this lady in the community and she's, you know, all hugging and kissing and everything and she leaves and I say, who the heck is she? I, I never met her. And one of the older, old timers tells me, of course you don't know her, she's conservative. And I'm like, she's what? And he's like, she started coming to the community when we started distributing conserves. You know, the concert food. So in Sarajevo, they heard, they picked the word conservative Jew from Ashkenazi experience. They don't have anything to do with it. So they applied to those people who come to the community only when there is distress and when the community distributes con food. So that's what conservative means for them. And reform is a kind of, of, of cooking. <laughs> really. Uh, so it's not a form, it's not a kind of kike, it's, it's kind of cookie. So, that's, that's, <coughs> that's another, that's another main, that's another main difference. So I said Talmudocentrism, right? Then, ethno, ethnocentrism, let me put it up, let me call that one. Conceiving the community as Jewish by definition. I mean, you really need, in order not to be considered Jewish in the in Sephardic world, you really need to make an act. You know, you need to convert to Yom Kippur and come with a huge cross to the synagogue. And even then, not nice, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean they will take you seriously. They will just think you, you went nuts. The community is, is not considered to be a cult, a religion. It's considered to be ethnicity. So, the Sephardic Jews lived in a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, multi-racial society. So they were not embodiment of otherness. The Ashkenazim had totally different experience. The Ashkenazim, in hundreds of kilometers around them, everybody was the same. Catholic, white, Christian. Then, when Catholics split into Catholics and Protestants, in a very European way, you know, humanistic and philanthropic and universalistic, the Protestants killed the Catholics, the Catholics killed the Protestants. The decision was, the king decides 
what's the religion of the real? And then he kills everybody else. Unless you are fast enough, <laughs> you move fast enough. So this is European, this is the, you know, and today Europe gives some, <laughs> I mean, so funny, Europe giving lectures on tolerance. Europe is synonym for lack, total lack of tolerance. I'll give you one example. I'll give you one example. Being the fact that there were no Muslims in the Catholic world, and there were no uh, Orthodox Christians in the Catholic world, and even when Protestants came to be, then the world split into Catholic and Protestant world, but there were no mixed societies. The Jews were the embodiment of otherness. They were the other. Now, the Jews, if you take the Ottoman Empire, they are not the other. Everybody is the other. You have there Armenians and Greeks and Serbs and Bulgarians and Gypsies and Jews. And these people are, these people <coughs> in the Ottoman Empire, you have Christians who believe that Jesus was only God. You have Christians who believe that Jesus was only man. You have Christians that believe that Jesus was God and man both. Okay. And everybody lives there. So, what happened is, and now I need you, <coughs> now I need you to follow very carefully. To that extent, Catholics were incapable of imagining the other as unsubjugated to their own values. That when Catholics had to imagine Jewish liturgy, they would imagine it to be the upside down Christian Catholic Mass. So you, you know all those places where the Jews are accused of taking the blood of Christian kids to make matzahs and you are aware of the fact that in Christian church in Catholic church, not in Orthodox church in Catholic church <coughs> the believer is not given the bread which represents the body of Christ the believer is not given the bread into his hand because he might be a Jew and he might take this consecrated bread and then you know, get it <coughs> ritually, uh, or do we did piss on it, or spit on it, or whatever. So, in order to prevent that, you are given a small piece of bread, which is unleavened bread, straight to your mouth, and it dissolves immediately. And you need to say, when the priest comes to you, he says, Corpus Christi. And before opening the mouth and receiving Corpus Christi, which means the body of Christ, you need to say Amen. And if you don't, he's not going to put that into your mouth. But even if you say Amen, they still don't believe you that you are a Christian. You might be a Jew. And you might want to take this bread back to synagogue to kill it. Now, so they imagined that the same way the bread is converted to the body of Christ and the wine is converted into blood of Christ, in Christian Mass, in Jewish Mass, you need the blood of Christian children to convert it into wine. You actually, you are actually doing the... So, you follow where this can come from. It can only come from monocultural, monolithic autism. They didn't have a clue. They imagined everybody else was like themselves. So if their religion was Jesus-ocentric, then Judaism was Jesus-ocentric upside down. But it, 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 all has to do about, it, it all has to do with Jesus. So they imagined the Jews would take the Heavenly Father and read it backwards. Now why would Jews read Heavenly Father? Because Christians could not imagine. How could you have a service without Heavenly Father? So, living in such a society, Living in such a society, you need to develop a strategy of survival. Now I'm speaking about the fourth difference between the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim, and that's, that one is not less important than the previous three. The fourth difference between the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim is the strategy of survival. The Sephardim and the Ashkenazim use different strategies of survival. Now I will show you um, I will show you um, 
with one single example, how does it work in Sephardic world? But I really need you to follow me, and I know that you all know the answers to the question. We just need to connect the information, the pieces of information. These are scattered bytes of information that you all have, no doubt. Tell me, in Spain, in Muslim Spain, <coughs> what types of literature were developed by Jews? In Muslim Spain. And later, I want you to tell me in which languages those things were written. Anybody? You, there is no doubt. You all have. Come on, they're all coming with Jew, from Jewish background. You all know. This is a Torah. It's Torah related, but which disciplines in Torah were developed to highest imaginable level in Spain? Philosophy, poetry, and within the poetry, secular poetry. Now I need you to concentrate very well. In what language the philosophy is written? Arabic. Arabic. In what language the poetry is written? Arabic. No? Hebrew. Hebrew. What the heck? In which language the secular poetry is written? Arabic. Arabic. Hebrew. Hebrew. And never since biblical time the Hebrew poetry <coughs> came to higher level, higher artistic level, Hebrew secular poetry. And who is writing this secular poetry? The rabbis and the sons of rabbis and the grandsons of rabbis and great grandsons of rabbis. And we have to ask ourselves, what happened to you guys? Your grandfather was a great, you yourself are a great halakhist and philosopher. Why do you write about the, how do you say seara in English? Hair. Why do you write about the hairs in the tail of the lions of Alhambra Fontaine? What's sublime about that? What's Jewish about that? What's rabbinical about that? What's uh, why would anybody in the same mind, and especially uh, an honorable rabbi, dedicate his time to write about the curls of his Berber um, uh, post, office, uh, post officer or whatever? I'm, I'm coming, yes. I'm coming to an end <coughs> with all of this. So. The strategy, Sephardic strategy is like this. You always, always, always take the means of the majority, the means of the majority community, and you prove minoritarian values. Again, you always take the means, the instruments of the surrounding majoritarian community, and you use it to prove your own values. Now in philosophy, in philosophy, the language is the mean. It's not the goal. So they use the mean of the surrounding community. They write in Judah Arabic in 10th, 11th, 12th century. Now, here I need you really to follow me and then we are done. And it's not going to hurt. Um, what is the apodictic proof of divinity of Islam in Quran? There is a place in Quran where Muhammad complains to God and he says, these people don't believe. You are the guy who sent me. And God tells him something. Now, is this in the real of power or politics or economy? What does God tell Muhammad is the final and definitive proof which would make all his enemies shut. God tells him, well let them then write poetry as beautiful as the poetry I'm revealing to you. So the proof of Quran, a predictive definitive proof of celestiality of Quran is in the realm of aesthetics. So basically the Islamic culture says 
Quran is divine because nobody can write such a beautiful thing. And this is, and only, only this is, the reason why the rabbis are writing secular poetry in Hebrew. Because they want to say, anything you can do in Arabic, we can do in Hebrew. And it will sound better. And it will click better. So you will write about the hairs in the tail of the lion on the fontaine in Alhambra, in Arabic, to show the high clickability of Arabic language. No other language clicks in that way. No other language rhymes in that way. No other language follows the internal logic of... of uh, no other language has written like Arabic. So they say anything you can, you can do in Arabic, we can do in Hebrew. So the secular poetry not, not, was not there because they were secular. And the secular poetry was not there because they were bored by religious poetry. The secular poetry was their way of showing the supremacy of Hebrew language. I don't have to believe in supremacy of Hebrew language, but it was necessary for them to make their followers believe in supremacy of Hebrew language because the only other option was, if it wasn't Hebrew, it was Arabic. And then really, if you look closely, most of the Christians who were conquered by the Arabs, the elites converted. Only the common people be, uh, stayed Christian. And in Jewish world, uh, within the Islamic realm, the elites stayed Jewish. And this is because they had this survival strategy, which is, let's use the means of the society. And now to make everything click together, so why is this relevant? Most of the Sephardic Jews were anyways killed in the Holocaust. Today we live in Israel where 45% uh, of, of the population are Ashkenazi and 45% of the population are Oriental. And there are maybe 5% of Ladinos being Sephardic. So who cares? And why should anybody care? Okay, nice chapter in Jewish history, but that's it, the end of story. Well, the thing is, many people talk a lot about Ashkenazification of Israelis. So Zionism took Oriental Jews and made them into Ashkenazi. So there is a lot of uh, anti-Oriental or anti-colonial or post-colonial. Okay. Now, without claiming that there is no such a thing as Ashkenazi he hegemony in Israel, I would still like to open your eyes to things that most of the people never see. The Zionism made everybody in this country Sephardic. Not Ashkenazi, not Oriental. How? By the language. You don't speak here the Ashkenazi Hebrew. You don't say Bari ha to adoinoi. You say Baruch ata Adonai. But you don't say here Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. You don't say Hato Muhammad Tayyib. You don't make a difference between Gimel and Rimel, between Het and Chaf, between Kof and Kaf. Oriental Jews do. So basically, and back to this. You see where is this one? Here. A part of the Mediterranean culture. So Israeli society, <coughs> consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously, picked Hebrew pronunciation which doesn't connect them to Eastern Europe because that would be kind of non-authentic even though I don't know what authentic means. The people felt that if they spoke Hebrew here with Shabbos and Sokes and Kedesh and Abdullah, that would be kind of not really working. But on the other side, they didn't say, well, let's be as authentic as it gets. Let's speak Hebrew with ko, ko, to, so. Sadiq, ata, adunai. No. So what did they, for which Hebrew they opted? For Mediterranean Ladino Hebrew. Now, I want you to pay attention to another fact on the ground, which is small, but highly symbolic. Israeli flag is white and blue. And everybody says it's based on talet, right? 
Talit in Ashkenazi tradition. In the Bible tradition, you would say Talit. Okay, well, let's see a beach toilet in space. How do the Ashkenazi toilet looks like? How does the Ashkenazi toilet looks like? White and black. And it's made of wool because they people live in the continent. So it's is it made of talet or not? If it's made of talet, of the Ashkenazi talet, it should be black and white. Now let's see how does the Oriental talet look like. White and white. White and white, and it's woolen. Again. So the only talet in the Jewish history that was white and blue is Sephardic silk talet which brings us straight back to the beginning of this lecture. While Sephardim lived in Spain, they were still continental society. They had woolen talitot, <coughs> right? And we don't know anything about their colors. Once they started governing the sea and controlling the merchandise crossing between the two wheels, they actually became also the most important people in the silk industry. They actually run the business, okay? The insects and the production and the distribution. So they said, we have this mitzvah of talet. Let's do it as beautiful as possible. Silk. So basically, silk talet, to my mind, symbolizes the switch from continental community to the Mediterranean community. And then interestingly enough, that was the talet picked by the Israeli society. Thank you. If you have questions. By the way, the concerted yeah. movement adopted the Spartan palette, the way it's worn. On, uh, there was an article that came out about the palette. Do you know about it? No. And I'll share it with, it with everybody. That the Spartan palette, um, uh, the Ashkenazi one, is draped over the shoulders. The traditional Spartan palette. Um, is actually over the arms as well, and it's it's not it's it's not as wide. And they show pictures from the Spanish Portuguese synagogues. And so, if I remember in the 60s, going, I grew up in a conservative synagogue. It was blue and white. It was always blue and white, and it was the silk fabric, it was not wool. And also, the, the conservative movement <coughs> adopted the Habarat Sfaradi as well. So there was a, a, a huge influence of, of Spartak minhag or culture on, on, on the rise of the, of the concerted movement of the United States as well. Very interesting. And also, I'll say this to all the gentlemen here, um, the Spartan never, ever, ever said that you should wait until you're married to wear a talit. And according to the Shulchan, according to all the, 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 uh, the rabbis, the moment that a child even questions, understands it, you buy him, at this case, him, a talit, right? So the concerted movement also began to introduce talit uh, to children even before the bar mitzvah as well, but for sure after For sure before, but for sure before they are married. Nice. Good note. Um, I don't want to keep any of you. If any of you have individual questions for Dr. Popple, you may approach him. But I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for a, a really an, an amazing um, lecture and putting all these pieces together. So, thank you. I have, yeah, I have more adrenaline that I can bear. Okay.